California's south coast is intensively urbanized and population is growing. Will our activities crowd out marine life? Or can both nature and human activities be accommodated and thrive? For decades, California has been a leader in creating marine protected areas. But things changed in 1999. It was then that the Marine Life Protection Act, the MLPA, called for the designation of a comprehensive and cohesive network of areas for special protection. The act divided the California coast into five regions, four along the open coast and the San Francisco Bay region. The result is a network of MPAs identified, located, and sized using the best science to ensure they will be effective in protecting and restoring marine life. In January 2012, the state designated 50 MPAs in the South Coast region, totaling more than 350 square miles, about 15% of the state waters of the Southern California Bight. In Southern California, the network allows for connectivity between the various protected areas along the coast. It allows the import and export of larvae from a marine protected area to another marine protected area and back and forth, and also could be populating outside the protected area, which we call spillover. Marine protected areas provide safe havens, places of refuge for marine life in an increasingly crowded coastal ocean. And in order to have our relatives survive in the ocean, we have to have places where they are safe, where there's, um, there's the lack of destruction, where they're able to breed and live and, and play the way they have always played and lived throughout their entire uh, history. MPAs increase diversity of species and abundance of key species, and they can help rebuild depleted fish stocks by providing places for fish to reproduce and grow successfully during critical early life history stages. And their benefits spill over into surrounding areas. MPAs uh, work because we're drawing a line in the ocean and we're saying that certain activities can happen inside that MPA and certain activities cannot happen inside that MPA. MPAs help increase ecosystem resiliency and promote ecosystem stability. But not all species respond in the same way. Different species have different response times. How long it takes for an MPA to show an effect really depends on the species of interest. Um, it depends on the growth rate of that particular species. It depends on whether or not that species, is, the home range size, how large of an area it lives in. Um, so for slow growing species like a rockfish, um, it may take seven or ten years before we see an effect. For something, uh, for species like the lobster, which is more quickly growing, we may see a response um, relatively um, fast because they are, uh, they grow more quickly. In spite of their anticipated benefits, putting certain areas off limits to fishing was not popular, at least initially with some commercial fishermen. One of our biggest problems in this whole process was the issue of compaction of putting the same number of fishermen into ever smaller areas. We know that's going to cause problems and most of us feel we should have gone through the whole MLPA process, put the MP, decided where we wanted to put them and then we should have adjusted our fisheries management to suit that and then implement the MPAs. Marine protected areas benefit not only marine life but also the economy they create jobs in one of the most important sectors of the Southern California ocean economy, coastal tourism and recreation. They do it by providing direct outlets for recreation and also by conserving the qualities that drive these activities, clean waters, diverse and productive ecosystems, aesthetics, and visual and physical access. 
Marine protected areas also provide living laboratories for scientists to study marine life, habitats, and ecosystems, and how they are affected by human activities. By providing sites where some human activities in the ocean, such as harvesting and recreation, are controlled, the effects of other stressors can be assessed. MPAs provide little direct protection from land-based stressors such as pollution or from global stressors such as climate change, although they have indirect benefits. More diverse ecosystems are more robust and have greater resilience in coping with environmental change, regardless of the driving force. Marine protected areas come in different sizes and shapes and have different restrictions on activities that are permitted and prohibited. There are several different types of marine protected areas to allow for various levels of protection. The marine reserve is the backbone for the network and it prohibits all take. We have a second tier which is called a marine conservation area that allows limited commercial and recreational take. And the third designation is a state marine park that allows only recreational take of species. The Marine Life Protection Act calls for a cohesive statewide network of marine protected areas along its 1,100 miles of open coastline and in San Francisco Bay to provide safe havens for different life history stages of important species and to provide protection to those with relatively large home ranges. The identification and designation of marine protected areas in each coastal segment is overseen by a Blue Ribbon Panel appointed by the California Secretary of Resources. The Blue Ribbon Panel receives advice from a science advisory team and a regional stakeholder group in each region to ensure that the best science is used and that the areas respond to the needs and concerns of different stakeholders. The Blue Ribbon Panel for each coastal region develops a set of alternatives that go to the California Fish and Game Commission for final selection. And the state did a very good job, I think, in engaging a diverse array of stakeholders in this process, one of which was the, the, the fishing community. They said, look, we, we know that, you know, th these are probably not uh, something that you like, but why don't you come to, come to the table and help us design uh, this network? And so that's what happened. Of the five coastal regions, the South Coast was perhaps the most challenging in designating a network of MPAs because of the large population and the diversity and intensity of the uses it makes of the ocean. The region is home to more than 60% of the state's population, the nation's two largest container ports, all of the state's offshore oil platforms and islands, and it receives more than 1.1 billion gallons of treated wastewater each day and it supports a modest but important commercial fishery. It also is a region with high environmental expectations, a strong ocean ethic, and intense and important societal uses for recreation, such as swimming, surfing, paddleboarding, snorkeling and scuba diving, and recreational fishing and boating. All can have impacts on coastal and marine ecosystems. When a bunch of people just out there sightseeing whales, there has to be rules and regulations so you don't bother the whales and, and spook them. Same way with seabirds. So it's all these things have to be taken into consideration when, when we're talking about marine management. The designation of marine protected areas is an important first step, but only the first. MPAs need to be monitored to assess their efficacy in achieving their goals and objectives and to provide the data and information needed to make whatever adjustments in size, shape, and location may be required over time to achieve their goals. In practice, what we should be doing is monitoring to see how the MPAs are performing and measuring that against the goals and objectives for that particular MPA. If uh, that MPA over a certain amount of time is not meeting those goals and objectives, um, we're supposed to uh, apply adaptive management principles. And in this process, it's incumbent on us to change the size or spacing or designation um, with information from monitoring so that we can uh, better approach meeting those goals and objectives. 
MPAs also need to be patrolled to enforce protection. Effective enforcement will require partnerships of the Department of Fish and Game wardens with citizen groups, much like neighborhood watch programs, to ensure the necessary enforcement. We absolutely need partners. We, uh, through this process, it was a collaborative effort to get where we're at now. And we recognize even if you doubled or tripled the number of game wardens, that's not going to do it. The, the communities that use and work and, and live and, and spend time around MPAs uh, need to be involved and know what's going on. And so one of our big challenges is that there's no signs, there's no you know, lines in the ocean to tell people when you're in a closure or when you're not. And the, the rules are a little bit different to protect different things in each closure. So from an enforcement standpoint and just a, a, a to gain compliance standpoint, that's been a huge issue for us. One of the things we've done is tried to embrace some new technology so that if a person has a smartphone or, uh, or GPS, that we've provided regulations that can overlay onto a GPS or that can be activated through a, a smartphone so it could tell them, hey, you're here and this is what the regulations are. Marine protected areas are an investment in creating a better future for marine life and for humans. They are an insurance policy against unexpected changes, natural and man-made, by increasing the resiliency of marine ecosystems. They also have huge intrinsic value. The ocean to us is always, always part of our life, part of our thoughts, part of our stories, and how we interrelate it. And I think that without the ocean, um, our people wouldn't know that any other way to survive. Setting aside parts of nature to receive special protection speaks to the human spirit. And I think this was the biggest public-private partnership in terms of managing marine resources that's ever taken place that the department's been involved in. The challenges in getting the right balance between protection and responsible use are large, but the potential rewards are even larger.